interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz-Cohen, and today we have as our guests two of the world's most prominent, eminent architects, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. This is part one of a two-part series. In part one, we'll focus on the philosophy and the careers of Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. And in part two, we'll, take, we'll talk more about architectural trends, and our guests will criticize some points in the history of architecture, will critique some of the points in the history of architecture. Um, Denise, Robert, welcome to the Drexel interview. Happy to be here. Um, Robert, your first book, Complexity and Contradiction, which was written in the 1960s, was a very influential book. Um, it's still cited, it's still used, it's still very prominent in architectural history. And you wrote it, however, when you were quite young, at the beginning of your career. Can you explain to us a little bit how it was that you were able to come up with something so formed, in a sense, so complete at that early stage? in your development as an architect? I think it was partly because I had a wonderful architectural education not too long before that time, uh, where I went to college uh, at, at Princeton as an undergraduate and a graduate. And there you were taught, which is unusual in those days, not just architectural design, which is very important, mm -hmm. but you were also taught architectural history. And I was fascinated by history and I was fascinated as a result of this kind of education I got with the idea of making analytical uh, comparisons, mm -hmm. that something is like this, but you understand that it's like this more vividly by comparing it to something else that's like it or in contrast to it. Yeah. So I think it derived pretty much from my knowledge and interest in history as well as in architecture of the time, but it did involve, that did involve some misunderstandings. People thought, oh, you are just pro-history and you're against modernism, and I wasn't at all. I'm a modern architect, I was then, and I loved it. But whenever you write something or say something, the chances are that it will be misunderstood very often. Yeah, I think that that's, tends to be true. I want to get back to those basic ideas in that book, but first I, I, I would like to ask Denise a little bit about her background. You were born in South Africa, and your training was originally in urban planning, as well as in no, architecture. No, actually, I was born in Zambia. In Zambia, and my first training was in architecture. Okay, well, um, I I got that wrong. Could you give us a little bit about your background? Yes, I I grew up in South Africa, okay. and started architecture school there, and then moved to England. And in the 1950s, I was in architecture school at the time of the, um, the social movement straight after World War II. The most famous part of it is the literary part where there was a play called Look Back in Anger. Mm -hmm. They talked about the Look Back in Anger generation. Yeah. Well, that whole very vital, socially vital time in England influenced me and added to what I'd learned in Africa. And by some coincidence, the in intellectual steps that Bob and I took paralleled each other. Mm -hmm. So that I started out with the notion that the landscape I see around me in Africa is beautiful despite the fact that the dominant culture, which was English-based, said that beauty was to be seen in the green hills of Surrey, mm -hmm. um, not the felt of South Africa. So I started out saying, what's wrong with where I live? It's fine, it's, it's terrific. Mm -hmm. So I sort of say I have an African view of Las Vegas, you see. So I had that, and I had already an interest in popular culture, partly from that, partly from England, where there was a lot of stress at that time about learning about the life of the streets in London, as you worked as an architect or a planner, trying to understand that. And also there was an interest in the 1950s in mannerism, which was looked upon as breaking rules and interested us because we were breaking the rules of, of architecture. And so the fact that these people had broken rules was fascinating too. And then I went to Italy a year later than Bob. And for both of us, Italy was an important piece of our intellectual background. So when we met at Penn, when we were both on the faculty there, we had these parallels which other people didn't share. So I started saving a place for him at faculty meetings and a cookie. 
<laughs> and, um, so, so there, there's uh, where it began. Yes. But if I, if I could just stop you for a second. So it sounds like you say you had parallel development, and yet it was also complementary, wouldn't you say? Because you say you're very interested in the history of architecture. And you were interested, I wouldn't say you weren't interested in history, but in landscape and popular culture. Would you say these were complementary? No, because Bob was very interested in popular culture, okay. and I was very interested in history. Okay. Um, but well, I think, Jim, if I may interrupt, I think you corrupted me a bit in, in interesting <laughs> me in popular culture because you took me to Las Vegas. Oh. And uh, so I wasn't quite so sold on popular culture until I met Denise and she had this influence on me. But it is interesting what Denise has just said about mannerism, which yeah. is that the, the idea in art of acknowledging um, exceptions and, uh, and uh, the power of ambiguity. Uh, and. Um, in a way, the book Complexity and Contradiction could have been called Mannerism and Architecture for Today because it was, it was acknowledging that you shouldn't be purist. And, it, and it, was, it was reacting against the modernism of the time, which, was, which engaged what was called man, minimalism. Right. So you had everything as very minimal and very pure. And I think what I was saying, and Denise was going along with it very much, was uh, let's look at art and look at the complexities and contradictions which are valid and which are not minimalist and not pure. So would you um, say... There's not, wasn't only yeah. history. Would you say that modernism then, in terms of the way you're speaking about it with respect to your own views, was trying to forget history uh, in, on yes. some level and that you were bringing it back as well as the whole popular I think culture. so. I think to a great extent uh, modernism was, in some ways correctly, reacting against the use of history and architecture in a certain way. In the previous periods, there were periods called eclectic periods, yeah. and you adapted Gothic architecture when you did a church or a chapel and a classical architecture when you did a civic building. And uh, so they were reacting against that. And, and kind of ironically, uh, these European modernists came, and Le Corbusier and others, came and looked at American industrial architecture, industrial vernacular, and it said, ah, let's look at this. So modernism combined abstraction, abstract art, connected with the abstract art of the, of the, of the 20th century aesthetic, but it also um, iron, uh, paradoxically combined the factory. The buildings looked like mm -hmm. factories, but they were minimalist factories. Sort of so It's very complex, too. that's right. Yeah, and, and, yeah. And, and so the aesthetic was all oh, factories are appropriate to learn from, but also abstraction was good. And it was good. It was great. My, I'm, I'm not against <laughs> You're modern, not putting down I'm not modernism. Against modernism. <laughs> okay. uh, but by that time, you were beginning to say, hey, it is getting a bit dry, and we should acknowledge more complexity well, and contradiction. Well, I'm very interested in what you said, and I don't know if Denise remembers that. You were the one who took Robert to Las Vegas for the first yes, time. Yes, but up Bob the, forgets that... Um, he was pretty interested himself from before then, um, from before I left Philadelphia, and I was wa walking around taking photographs of popular culture in Philadelphia. And he not only encouraged that and shared that, was amused by the things I saw in Philadelphia that he didn't notice, but also when the social planning movement hit Penn, and yeah. Penn was one of the places that introduced the notion of social planning and advocacy as a, a role for architects and planners, advocacy for the poor mm -hmm. and the unrepresented. Um, much, many of the people in the architecture school at Penn were sarcastic about all of that. Bob was one of the few people who sympathized mm -hmm. because of his mother, and she'd been a socialist. And so I got much more sympathy from Bob, who was looked upon as an architect's architect, uh -huh. than from the architects there who were considered to be kind of planning-based urban design architects. Because he was in some ways more open yes. politically, Yes, I yes. see. Politically, that's right, politically and, and, and sociologically, but also aesthetically. And we kind of say we, we love diners and cathedrals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it is interesting. I mean, you were, I suppose you've been associated with the beginnings of postmodernism, but I don't know how comfortable you feel with my saying that. We wrote, uh, I wrote an article a while back, I was asked to write an article about my attitude toward postmodernism, and on the cover of the magazine, there was a quotation where I said, I am not 
I am not a communist, and I have never been a You're communist. You're not a communist. I mean, I am not, <laughs> I am not a postmodern. I was using that, that communist phrase so that my mistake yeah. was not inappropriate. Yeah. I am not a postmodernist, and I have I've never, never been, been a postmodernist. Yeah. And postmodernism was really, again, we were tagged with that. And to some extent, we were postmodern. But we don't like it because postmodernism really involved a misinterpretation of us. It, it, it said more or less, hey, it's OK to build uh, and copy the styles of the past as architects, architecture had done in the eight, 19th century. So we're not postmodernists. I, th I think you have to say that's in an architectural sense, because there's yeah. a broader this sense is. in which postmodernism means things like loss of innocence, um, a, a new way of thinking after the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, it's a more cultural sense of postmodernism. Yes, and in that and you do a, fit, a, perhaps. An openness to yeah. multiple values, right. to That's multicultures. That's how I think of it as yes. a literary as and scholar. He, sure, yeah. and that we're very <clears throat> sympathetic with. It's just that the architects misused it. Okay. The architects said, if the social planners say we have a f physical bias that doesn't help the poor, and if we can't help the poor, well, let's just do what we like. Yeah. And that was a misunderstanding. So it's a throwing up the hands, in yes. a sense. Denise said a yeah. wonderful thing once. Uh, um, Freud was not a Freudian, and Marx was not a Marxist. So it's a bit pretentious, but we can say uh, You're Venturi not, is not a not postmodernist. Not a postmodernist, even though you've been hard with that brush. <laughs> um, I want to, you know, the, there's a very famous dictum associated with your work. I mean, the, the famous modernist phrase is form follows function. And you revise this, and I think rather elegantly, with the term form accommodates function. And the image you use, or the contrast that you use, is between the glove, form follows function, something that fits very tightly, to, to the mitten. I happen to like mittens myself. So tell us a little bit about this idea and, and what you mean when you talk in terms of form accommodating function. And I guess that dates back to your earliest work. I think it's one way to explain where we stand, where modernism, one of the main phrases of modernism was um, uh, you design from the inside out. Yeah. Uh, Le Corbusier said that, and Frank Lloyd Wright said that. Both of them said it. They were two leaders, but both kind of aesthetic enemies. Yeah. So two leaders in modernism, but ironically, they both said that. Yeah. And what we like to say is context is important, and you, and you design from the outside in as well in the same building as the inside out. But the inside out, of course, connects very much with the idea of functionalism, that you, you, you make the building connect very much with the immediate function. And we like to say, involving complexity and contradiction, that functions are constantly changing within a building. Before you design, before you finish designing it, usually the program has changed to some extent. And there is a long tradition of wonderful buildings that um, are loft buildings. The Italian Palazzo is one. The building we're in, the beautiful building we're in at Dexel is one. Yeah. Uh, the industrial loft is one. As I said, the Italian Palazzo is one. Uh, academic buildings are one, where the buildings can, can accommodate change over time, and where in the mitten, uh, things, the, the fingers can grow, can grow room, differently. So yeah. And that connects us again to architecture, which is based not, which then is not based on being articulated form. Uh, ah, the, uh, it's interesting form, uh, but because that form is going to be changing inside. Uh, but it is um, the loft building where the form is not, quote, interesting. What's interesting is the surfaces of the building, the, 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 the often ornamental surfaces. And that's very anti-modern architecture because yeah. it's saying, ah, Let's engage signage, let's engage symbols, and let's engage ornament. All, you can combine all those words into iconography. And that, of course, we learned very much from learning from Las Vegas. Yeah, I wanted to talk, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that very seminal book, Learning from Las Vegas. And it, it is such a groundbreaking, such a shocking book in a way. Even now, I think, the idea that the iconography of Las Vegas that we tend to dismiss 